recorded. Okay. We're good. So does Matt call the meeting to order? So called. Okay. <laughs> 104. Um, all right, I'm running this meeting. I can run it. <laughs> Whatever you want to do is fine with me. <laughs> that email? All right. <laughs> you woke me up. Since I start, I, I initiated it. Um, so we, we all received the report from um, OLA. There were some revisions that Jen did for us based on our meeting that we had last time. And we had um, the discussion with Jim at our meeting as well as at the board meeting. So I wanted to know from this group, what, you know, what are your thoughts? What are some potential next steps going forward? Um, I just wanted to get that conversation started. Well, I think that from our meeting, we felt that it made sense to tackle the, uh, air conditioning problems by looking at the first step of the, um, I don't want to, proposals or concepts that were provided to us at the meeting. And obviously we have to take into consideration all the issues from financing and timing and the impact on the air quality if we want to incorporate higher circulating or faster circulating airflow. And I also felt it was imperative, even though it would seem financially over, overbearing, to also add the controls for the pumps or the wells that are in the ground for the HVA system. So the, the expense is gigantic, but those two issues are the primary ones facing the system, in my opinion, based on what the, how the meeting went. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I kind of walked away from it. We're committed. We need to see this through, although the dollars are scary. Right. Um, so if can we're... I go, go I'd like to go back to the question um, of, and I'm so glad John is here, about the putting, what was it, 125,000 into the controls, a new control system for the well system. Um, if we do this new control system, does that, is that going to help anything that we are adding or is it only going to impact the wells that are there in their current state? Well, we're adding um, components to an existing system to increase its efficiency and potentially pro prolong its longevity because we'll be able to spread the workload among the various segments of it. If, and, and that being the case, this control system then seemed like it would be essential to me to make sure that it's in place. But I just want to be sure that I really understand this clearly. Right. So the way the system, I'm sorry, the way it runs now, um, Doyle felt that it was almost ineffective because we're blind, so to speak, about what's going on down at the wells. And right now, John Tortoso has been manually manipulating the system to move the flow of water from one well to another, almost based on gut with very little data or output. Mm -hmm. adding these controls won't take away the need for someone to be aware of what's going on in the system. But we'll, if I'm right, Karen, will reduce the need for all the manual uh, expertise that we have now. The way I understand it, and John, you can correct me if I'm wrong or confirm, um, the, the well controls will essentially give us um, sort of eyes into each individual well to understand what's going on in the well as far as the water level goes. So one of the problems that we have, as you know, is we burn out pumps like crazy. And this tends to happen when the water level drops and 
and the pump's still going. Um, from what I, from my understanding, the well controls are meant to allow us to see before that happens, before the pump burns out, that a water level has dropped and, um, and I guess be able to turn that pump off until the situation is corrected. Am I right about that, John? Partially, the bottom line, which you're gonna get also, which you can't do anything with the controls is the amount of sand that comes up also. The sand is what has the problem, that makes the problem with the pumps. That's what wears the pump out, it's the sand that we're getting. And the same not thing- the water, Not the water levels? The water, but the density that you find as the water goes down is still, is you get more sand. And so as it if goes up, you get a little less sand, but you're not gonna get rid of the sand. No, but would we be able to, for instance, turn off a pump when we see that the water level's low to prevent the large amount of sand to come up at that time? Or am I wrong in that? Well, the problem with turning the pump off is that when you first start it back up again, you get more sand. Even though the water levels are high, you're still going to get the sand in there. And I think the answer to your question, Karen, is, is more so that the water will be not turned off, but moved to another pump that is not pumping as well that needs some assistance in that regard. What the whole thing boils down to is that we don't have that ability right now, um, unless John is manually monitoring moment by moment what's going on down there. That's the whole point of adding this system. Well, and I, I don't, go ahead, John. Go ahead. No, what I was gonna say was, I don't think, John, that you can know what's going on down there. You can sort of get an, an inkling once the water is all combined and it comes up, but you don't necessarily know what the level of the water is for a particular well. Am I correct? Right, you, you don't, that you don't know, but you could tell one of, one of the uh, signs is a lot of air bubbles that you start seeing that way. That's where you start seeing it. Like after right. three rain, we got plenty of water. We have no air bubbles and everything is running fine. But do we get this that situation that often? We don't. But when you see the air bubbles, are you able to know which well they're coming from? Because there's the uh, sight glass, not the sight glasses, but the filter housing is clear and you can see the air bubbles. For each well? That's separately. mainly four, three and four, uh, four and five are the only two that you get that. One through three is fine. But so for instance, if you, you can see that there are air, bu air bubbles coming up from four, yes. for instance, right? Or yes. you could see that there are air bubbles coming up from five, correct? Yes. So with, with and this- it's predominant. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Would this new control system then be sensitive to that period when air bubbles would come up? so that you wouldn't be monitoring it visually, the control system would pick that up? Well, it would do that. It would tell you what, when the water level goes down that it would start pumping. Now there's a lot of piping that has to go along with that. It's not as, as simple as just putting a sensor in and saying one well is down and we got to pump to it. There's no way of pumping to it right now because the pumps, the wells are not interconnected only until they get in the building. And then they have to upgrade our operating system um, to accommodate this technology, um, was what I remember from my question to Jim Dolan. And, and I guess my other question, do you agree with that? Yes. Anyone? Yes. Okay. So then the other thing is looking forward, does this technology or monitoring system apply to the other units that are being added to our system? Well, the new, the what he's proposing to do is you can have air-cooled systems. So you're not gonna be using the wells right. as it goes on. And if you look at his uh, write-ups, they're all air-cooled. None of them are water-cooled. Mm -hmm. So as you add more units, you are gonna stop using the wells as, over a period of time. So we're putting in, if we were to do this, we would be putting in a control system that has basically got a, an end date to it when the wells are no longer used. It won't be used with any of the new equipment. Right. Yeah, you're um, not going to... Go ahead, I'm uh, sorry. That's okay. The Jim's um, philosophy, I guess you could say, 
is that we aren't going to be able to put in all of these systems, these new systems quickly. Um, and so we need to try to get as much life out of the well system as we can. He also mentioned, and, and this is sort of a big consideration, the la in my mind anyway, the last step of all of this, you know, let's say we go through all these different phases, is to put a, a big chiller um, down in the parking lot. And I know that Jim was, you know, there are some big concerns about doing that. So there, and we may end up there, but I, I think what, I think what Jim is trying to avoid is forcing us to have that chiller and letting us get up, get by on the wells for an extended period of time. I think that's what he's trying to get to. Right, because from early on, we wanted that approach. Right. Now, the, the chiller, I've, I've saw this the first time I've, not the, well, after his last meeting, was the first time I saw that. Uh, what is it going to do? The chiller that he's talking about, what is he's He's putting a chiller outside the theater on right. the ground and all these air-cooled units. What is the chiller? So let's look at his plan and see if he describes that to us. Let's see. Phase four, if needed, abandon the wells, replace the heat pumps with AHUs uh, and air handling units and tie into the hot water system and install a new air-cooled chiller. Um, from my recollection, he's proposing the chiller because the rooftop units won't be able to carry the whole building without the wells. If we want to get off the wells, we would need to add additional cooling in order to accomplish that, and the chiller would give us that capacity. Okay. The only question, the big question I have is, we're talking about a chiller. Why don't we just put a cooling tower on the roof and do away with the chiller? We have talked about cooling towers in the past. Um, Jim's recommendation was that they are um, not recommended due to a number of things, one of which being the, um, what is it called? The, the, oh God, I'm not thinking of the word. The, we Please. Permitting permitting and inspections have gotten uh, very cumbersome due to Legionnaires outbreaks and things like that. Okay, I haven't I haven't looked into them too much of that, but I did look into the cooling tower. And once you had someone who was um, the technology is there to keep the cooling tower and chemicals in balance. So, uh, because you're gonna, the chiller's gonna use a lot of power. Chiller's not, you know, it's all power driven. So. Well, I, I think that, I think that the chiller is the last thing in the line of things. And I think Jim is sort of trying to um, not have us have to do that. Yeah, it's well, a it's last that's, resort. So, I, yeah. I mean, it might not even ever happen. Right, it's not, and that's, you know, but if you're going to go that next step, the tower does the, on the last page. Yeah. Much. And we were concerned about um, the, the ground under the children in the parking lot. That was the other factor. Yes. Yes. I, I think the big, um, the big drawbacks to that chiller, but again, that's, you know, that's a last step uh, is the, um, the sound mitigation that would have to happen um, and the loss of parking. I think that there was some concern about the integrity of the wall, but I, I, I'm pretty certain that Jim did not feel that that was an issue because it's so close to the building. Of course, one of the other things we had talked about and then had a definitely short life when we were talking about it was the um, after coolers. 
is to put after coolers in on the wells so the water going back instead of being 100 degrees, we'd be in the 80, 70 to 80 degree range. Did you ever talk about that with Jim? I talked about it, but we never, never gets to go much further than that. What was his response? Uh, really, there was not, not that I could remember of any, any response whatsoever. Well, I don't think that um, anything you said isn't important. I just think that the timing is such that we can pursue and investigate what it is that seems like a reasonable next step. <clears throat> because the water towers, besides the uh, certification challenges, also create a concern about legionnaires and also who's going to maintain that system by climbing up on the roof multiple times a year. So before we even get to deciding <clears throat> which technology we want, we're gonna to have to start investigating them. And I think I'm comfortable in investigating the system that Jim recommended and then see perhaps it'll become financially unfeasible. Perhaps there'll be a uh, concern about the integrity of the roof with a system like that on it. So I, I think that it makes sense to find out those questions, the answers to those questions right now. Yeah, I think that's a good starting point. I think we should definitely uh, uh, approach that that way. So I, that I did do on the tower. So I, you know, have some numbers on that. But the uh, after coolers was another one that, you know, size, noise, and you know things like that. So. In, in terms of finances, um, what are we looking at? Is there anything that we could even plan on doing in the next 12 to 24 months with where we stand financially? Um, so I'm going to, I have to have Bob um, put together an update of where we are with our um, unallocated fund balance. He's just finished, you know, he just finished up with the auditor. So he always gives me a little update after that. We have, you know, because we got the $411,000 grant from the state for the boiler, we are not going to have to tap into our capital fund uh, plus the two $50,000 grants as well. So we essentially got $511,000 for the boiler, um, which is a $600,000 project. So we do have money in our capital fund as well as our unallocated fund balance because we've underspent for a couple of years and we've been um, growing that, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I can have Bob put together some numbers. You know, we, we have to be careful about depleting the unallocated fund balance because we, well, it's a rainy day fund. First of all, if we have a giant emergency, we need to be able to pay for whatever it is to, to fix it. Um, but we also like to have, it's not a necessity, but it's good practice. We like to have um, three to four months of operating expenses in there so that we can, you know, get through until we get our tax allocation. But I'll have Bob put that information together so that we have those numbers a little bit more firmly. Um, we did the we had had four hundred thousand dollars set aside in our capital fund, um, and in addition, there's other money in the unallocated fund balance. But um, I'll get you good numbers on that. As far as state funding goes, you, we're not going to, you know, you know how things are now. <laughs> So we're, I don't think we're going to see another $400,000 grant anytime soon. What I would like to do is to time whatever project we decide to do so that we can apply for the state construction grant money. We'll get something, um, maybe $50,000, maybe if we're lucky, $100,000. But we're not going to get a big chunk anymore. And I very much doubt... We can certainly ask our state representatives. Um, they're often generous about giving, um, they used to call it something else, but I'm an, a member member line, I can't remember what it's called. 
Um, but again, because of the state budget woes, who knows what we're gonna have available to us. So I think what would be prudent is, um, is to break the projects into manageable chunks. I mean, like, we, like we've done already, we decide which phase in Jim's proposal we would like to tackle first. Um, get some solid numbers from, you know, of what we have to spend and start working on, um, start working on the, the drawings and plans so that we can get SED to give their approval. I'm sorry, that was a very long winded answer, a non answer. <laughs> Those grants don't um, fully tie into the whole proposal, just a, just a particular aspect of it. Um, the grants, yes. So we can write the grant for as much or as little as we like. Um, and the best way to maximize those grants because they're yearly is to do project by project by project over time so that each year we can get something towards it. It's, um, you know, if we were, if we had the funds to do this whole thing all at once, we could apply for that, but we would only get whatever little bit that they gave this year and that would be the end of it. We wouldn't want to try and go for a bond through the, uh, as ta you know, to put it on the ballot in the spring. That's definitely a possibility. I'm, I always shy away from that one. <laughs> Into, I, I, I don't like the idea of doing it. However, in terms of the funding that we would be asking for, it seems like it is a very small amount compared to the other dollars that will appear on the ballot for the school board or for the school district and then for the library. So it may be something where voters would just check it off without being too concerned. Right. I don't know, just I've got to throw it out there as it's another possibility, right? It's definitely a possibility, yeah. And, um, you know, again, if, if the board, if we decide to do that, then we would decide, you know, how much of the project we would want to accomplish mm -hmm. with that bond. Could be nice to be covered for the whole thing. And that would be fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in moving, I just want to go back to the, the recommendations that we got from Jim. He had a phase one. So the control panel was not in phase one, correct? That would be phase two. Well, he, he didn't put it in phase one, but he did say that we could mix and match these a bit. And if we wanted to tackle the well controls, we could most certainly put that in with um, phase one. My, my gut feeling about that is that if we are looking at this whole process taking a number of years, I'm just going to say five to 10, just throwing those numbers out. I have no rationale for that, but five to 10 years, then it makes a lot of sense to me to have the control panel in place because it will basically, um, I looked at the cost per pump at six, basically five to $6,000 per pump. There's a, I can see a rationale for putting it in then. In addition to making John's job a lot easier, right? right. And, and saving in many ways, but I don't know where everybody, and it may be something we could afford to do up front. I don't know where everybody else is with this. It sounds reasonable. Because if we don't put a bond, if we don't get a bond for all of this money, we're going to be piecing this out bit by bit by bit for a long right. time. Yeah, absolutely. Um.
One thing that I don't remember, and maybe somebody does remember, in phase one, um, Jim had suggested that we replace AC4 and then add a new uh, rooftop unit for the mezzanine. He also said we could swap out four and five. So if we instead wanted to replace five and do four in a later stage, we could do that as well. The thing I don't remember is would we, let's say we decided, yes, we want to do, we want to replace out AC4. And we also want to do the new mezzanine rooftop, but it, we don't necessarily want to do them together in the same project. Are those two projects able to stand on their own? Yes, they were both separate. Okay, thank you, Matt. And the reason I, I ask that is because if we, let's say we wanna do the well monitoring and we wanna do one other piece of it. If we were to do the well monitoring and the less expensive of the things in phase one, which would be the mezzanine rooftop unit at $283,000, those two projects together um, would be like three, or it'd be a little over 400,000, well, probably more like 500,000 knowing how things are. Um, you know, I wonder if that isn't something that we could, we could start with once we look at our, our funds and, and um, see where we stand and what we are comfortable with. Sure. And that's, that's not to take, that's, I'm not saying that doing a bond should be off the table. I think that that needs to be a discussion that's happening at well as well. They agree. Yeah. So, so I'm sorry. You're saying do the new mezzanine and the controls upgrade? Yeah. If the mezzanine can stay, if the mezzanine can stand on its own, mm -hmm. do that and the well controls together as a project. If we feel comfortable using our capital fund to support that project, mm -hmm. and I would write a grant at this. You know, I would write a grant for next grant cycle as long as I can get it through SED in time. Mm -hmm. Well, since we have, we approved or agreed that we're going to basically make the, replace the coils and things on AC5, that ought to be good for quite a while still. We don't have to replace that right away. We We've would hope. I'm there. <laughs> we would hope. Yeah. <laughs> it will be repaired and it will work for a time. Yeah. So doing the wells control system upgrade means that we this will impact all of the wells. Yes. Okay. Okay. And so what's the timeline? Because the fact that we don't have our normal level of visitors now gives us an opportunity to do this capital work mm. uh, more quickly. So when could this begin once we get all the approvals in place? 2022. What? Yeah. Early 22? 2022. The, yeah, the approvals is going to be the sticking point. Um, SED is always on a lag. Last time it took a more, like a year and a half or something like that to get the approval for the boiler project. It was some long period of time. Um, what I can do is investigate what kind of time, what kind of timeline SED is on right now. There's also a provision that if we pay SED to expedite our project, we can do that. I can find out how much that is. Essentially, we have to pay for the expense of the engineer to look at it. Um, so I'll, I'll find out all that information to see what we're up against as far as timing goes. Okay. I also wouldn't want to start the project. I mean, I wouldn't want to start the actual work of the project. Um, prior to July 1 of next year, because I, I want to write the grant. So I have to, I have to time it properly for that. But I don't think that will be, I don't think there's any danger of that happening. Do you want me to investigate bonding too? 
I had put together some information on that a few years back, but I, I'd have to find my notes and I'd have to get updates. But that's not um, a problem. I don't know where the rest of the board is on bonding. I brought it. Do we want to have that as a topic of discussion at our next meeting? Yeah, I don't know anything about that. So I'm probably not alone. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. This, this question is for uh, Matt. Um, did, when he proposed the, uh, the air conditioning for the uh, mezzanine, was there a separate bid or a separate part for the structure that has to be built to put the air conditioner on? And what do they plan to do down below in the mezzanine to keep the air conditioning at the mezzanine without it going into where uh, Unit 5 would be using? Yes, he, he um, indicated that there would be a separate timeline and a separate expense for assuring the in structural integrity of the the roof and such things as by vi potential vibrations and he just gave us a heads up we didn't really go into it in any detail we didn't really have any uh, factors that we could examine at that meeting okay because that part of it is is not a small part right he also said that might put the in my words the kibosh on that idea, if um, we can't presume that the uh, the structure of that roof will handle a, a unit like that, well, the beams will that. But they what they end up doing is they would weld to the beams uh, a sports structure that would house the air conditioner on top of it. It wouldn't be mounted right on the roof, and it would probably be visible from the street. Well, it has a from what I see of what he's the type of unit he's proposing. It should be low enough uh, profile that it should be, you know, and, and also it could be further inside the roof, um, halfway between the first, the front and the back. He didn't say that. Right. But also the part that how he's going to isolate the mezzanine from the second floor would be a big question. I don't think there's a way to do that apart well, from building a wall. Well, that's one of the questions is that, you know, he, if, because if you drop the air conditioning into this, under the mezzanine, it's gonna end up going, air, air conditioning is heavy. Air hot, uh, cold air is heavy, it's gonna drop. It's not gonna stay there. So what you're gonna have to do is do, something has to be done to maintain the air conditioning for that unit in that closed area. My question would be, I'm. I don't, I didn't see anything about it. What does he plan to do? Or how is he planned to do that? I don't think we're up for that uh, discussion. We, we were a little overwhelmed with the material we had. Does he address some of that though, John, in his COVID strategies about airflow and operating two hours before and one hour after occupancy, those details? Does that address some of what you're saying? No, it has nothing to do with that. You're talking about the virus more than anything else with the two hours. And the air exchange, okay. Yeah, I think that it, it wasn't explored in any more detail because we were so far away from that piece of it. Okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to cost out every variance if you don't know you're gonna go there. Right. Um, But it's more the it's more the concept of how how do you plan to isolate it? Is That's it possible? Yeah. To but, but also, I mean, at some point we're going to have to do something about the mezzanine because it's not usable. And so, you know, we may not have the answer right now. But the answer isn't that we're not going to look for something. We're going to have to look for something. John, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. It, no, it's, it's, it's just not right now it's not this meeting and this proposal is it possible that the air conditioning for the mezzanine 
would be would work if we have that new that AC four replaced with the RTU four, because aren't they cooling adjacent areas? Is he thinking that those two areas will complement one another with cool air? It's only AC five is the one that controls that area. Oh, okay. Thank you. So it would probably make better sense to pair the AC5 project with the mezzanine project, don't you think? Same area. So AC5 costs less than AC4. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Small unit. Yeah. Right. yeah. You, for what reason? That was installed that way. Who knows? That's what they were. So what, what do you think? think we should be doing to sort of help us get our heads around what would be a good next step? Well, I think we're at the point where we have to figure out how much we can afford. And I think we should consider replacing AC4 and putting in the controls for the wells and we would have to ask um, our consultant to tell us what the next step are, if they're ready to go out to bid or if he has to prepare a bid. He, he would definitely have, if we were to say to him tomorrow, we wanted to do AC4 or whatever, it would be a whole separate, um, he'd have to prepare the bids. And everything for SC for bid we wouldn't prepare the bids right now we would have to prepare the drawings for SED for the SED submission well if it's in the budget that's what we'd have to do and, and what about the question that John just raised about the air conditioning working for with AC for the way it's set up in the mezzanine Will that work with the AC5 improvements that we've made now? Or do we need something from Jim identifying how he's going to have the airflow, how the airflow works? That's what you were asking, right, John? Yeah. I, don't, I, I can't answer that. Can you answer that? <laughs> No, I think that's an additional question for Jim. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe what a good next step is would be to have another conversation with Jim now that we've had a chance to sort of digest this a little bit and we have questions. Well, I don't think you want to have never-ending questions with Jim unless the board says, okay, we endorse what the recommendation of the committee is and would you please get the answers to these questions and then proceed depending upon the timing or if you have to come back to the board and then proceed to ask Jim to draw up plans and how much that would cost. So that I'm clear. So our next, what is, what is our next step that we need, that I need to take care of, that I need to do so that we can <laughs> Do, do something. I'm sorry to be difficult. We want to let Jim know that we're, we're, uh, our sentiment is initially to proceed with the, the recommendations to replace um, five and to put in the controls for the wells. And does he have a, a cost estimate for what drawing up those proposals would be? And then before, during, or after, tell the board that this committee has a recommendation and I don't want to overstep on the chairperson, but potentially that this committee has a recommendation to proceed 
with those two initial priorities. And if they concur, we'll check the budget, see if we have the money to pay for the, uh, the plans to be drawn up by Jim and ask Jim specifically what the next step is and also ask him to answer the questions that you have. Hey, Matt. Yes. One of the things I could talk into is that when I mentioned the last time with Jim was a less high technology uh, water level. Yes, it won't balance them, but instead of spending that type of dollars, we could see what a um, non-technology type uh, or minimum technology on the water balancing would be. Yeah, I recall you bringing that up and his initial response was, that's just the nature of the technology today. It's, uh, there isn't any leeway, but we can certainly bring that up again to him and inquire. Yeah, I, what I'll start doing is I'll start seeing what's out there. Okay. So we have something to talk about. Good. Thank you. So I'm, I'm asking Jim for cost estimates for drawing up uh, plans for um, for the bids. No, for SED. Um, yes, SED. SED right. approvals. But right. I'm asking him specifically for a cost estimate for the plans for the well control upgrades and. AC4 or AC5 or the mezzanine or two or three of them? Pick your poison. We, we can go with, uh, he said four is failing. Is that right, John? Four doesn't have the same lifespan as uh, five or the others. I'm sorry, I didn't four, hear the first. Four keeps breaking. <laughs> four, right. Right, so four was the priority because it doesn't have the same lifespan as the other units? Well, most of it's been replaced already. We replaced the compressors, we replaced the coils, we replaced the condensate coil. Okay. So four and five will be the same way when they get done, when that work too, it'll be basically a newer unit. Right, but they keep, I mean, they go down four has gone down since we've done the, you know, the coil's been replaced and that's working and the compressor's been replaced. But I mean, we seem to lose four on a fairly regular basis. Am that's I wrong about four that? Was, was his recommendation. Yeah. So whether or not we've done work on it, I, I just, I don't know. He never felt gonna... that we totally repaired that. He said we replaced parts, but that unit doesn't have the same lifespan was his point. Right. And that's, that serves more area, right, John, than five? Right, that does the second floor, the office areas, and also the whole first floor. Oh, right. that's critical. Yeah. Okay, so I'll get a cost estimate for him, from him, for drawing up the plans for the AC4 replacement and the well controls. Are we going to leave the mezzanine for now alone? Um. What's your feeling about that expense? If you think we should go for the whole um, package, by all means. I, w I was just hesitant. I didn't know how much we could um, partial it out. Yeah. Well, we could ask him to draw up plans for the whole phase one, replacing AC4 with AC5. So phase one, but AC5, I'm sorry. No, with AC4, I get the two of them mixed up all the time. So I could ask him for a cost estimate for drawing up for the full phase one that he spent out for us and, sure. and plus the well control system. Fine. And if we find we have to break it out, then we break it out. Okay, Fine. thank you. Just to make sure I'm doing the right thing. Mm And mezzanine is included in that also. Yes. Okay, just checking. And that's phase two. 
phase one. Well, no, yes. we new, phase new one. phase, new phase two. We've done phase right. one. The right. boy is, so sorry about that. No problem. New phase two. Plus mezzanine, just make sure. Okay. So those are my March down orders. That's good. Okay. Is there more that we wanted to discuss on the HVAC before we move on to the office modular spaces? <laughs> no, okay. Um, so I sent you and Kathy sent you the, um, the documents that Molly has been putting together um, for some modular spaces in the library, which could be used for offices and or meeting spaces. Molly, can I turn it over to you? Sure. So uh, if we look back to our architectural ideas and plans, one of the things that we were hoping to do is get more meeting room space um, and particularly small reading room, meeting room space. In the time of COVID, things are a little different, but ultimately um, it's still what our patrons want and it's still what we need to do. Um, instead of actual um, heavy duty interior construction, one of the things you can do is put up modular units. Um, and so there are three proposed spaces. And today what we're not looking for is to say, um, you know, these are ready to go. Um, these are proposals. And so what we're looking for is basically, if you like the idea and think it's a good investment, can we go to the next step and finish the investigation um, and get things more you know, nailed down so that we'd have exact prices and an exact timeline? What I can tell you is that the current timeline for installation of this kind of thing is 10 to 12 weeks. Um, what's good about these projects is they happen relatively quickly and that's a wonderful thing. And they do provide us with some flexibility. Um, if you look at what was sent to you, um, basically we're proposing spaces that um, currently could be used as offices, offices for teen room staff and offices for other staff we're trying to isolate during COVID. Um, in particular, um, the things that are in what's called the galaxy corner. Um, those two spaces you, I think some of you on the committee have looked at before, they were taped off on the floor. Mm -hmm. This would provide two small meeting rooms that could hold um, you know, three or four people or just a single person, or they could act as an individual office. The ones that are for the teen um, staff, those would be two offices, the head of the teen department, and one of their assistants, or if we didn't need to use both offices, one could be a small meeting room. If things change in the future, they can both be small meeting rooms. Um, and then there's a larger space, which would make a second conference room, similar to the conference room we have on the second floor, but this would be located on the first floor behind the information desk. And, one of the things we're doing right now is investigating um, how the ventilation will work. Currently, there are vents in those spaces. They're being served by our existing ventilation system. The question is, if the walls are enclosed and there's a door, how does that impact? And also, do the sprinklers land in the right place? So Jim is helping us do a preliminary investigation and again, if we have the go ahead, we'd go to the next step of finding out more. If you look at the prices for these things, um, it may be exciting when you first notice the total, but what I would encourage you to do is cost these things out over 10 years. Um, obviously we're gonna be using them for longer than 10 years. <laughs> and so you really do get a lot of um, bang for your buck. And the other thing is we're putting an awful lot of money into things that are absolutely necessary, but our patrons can't see. And um, Karen and I have been working really hard to find some things we can do to the interior that answer 
um, people's needs and the things that they requested. And meeting room space was certainly a critical component of that. It's something our patrons can see immediately that is available. And these are the only um, service type improvements we're looking to do to the interior, um, carpeting, painting. There are a lot of things that have never been replaced as from the time this building was built and the wear and tear is really showing. Um, but in particular, uh, I think this is a good solution for us. Uh, I'm confident that especially the um, space on the ground level behind the information desk, that that would be an excellent space for the library overall. It, it gives us another large conference room. It's a conference room that the Board of Trustees could meet in, for example. It's a space that can be used by multiple small groups. It's a space that can be used for staffing and staff events. Um, it's also an excellent visibility space. Um, it gives us access to a lot of natural light and makes much better use of the space than we're making now. So that's my little speech. I'd love to answer questions. So you talked about ventilation. Is, is the space enclosed on all five sides then? The ceiling and the four walls? The walls go to our existing ceiling, yes. Okay. And so besides ventilation, what about sound? Sound that can come in, for instance, announcements or uh, God forbid, fire alarms and outgoing sound, how noisy might they become? It's my understanding that the sound will be the same. The sound, it, you know, our rooms right now aren't as soundproof as perhaps we would love, <laughs> but, um, you know, they're, they're manageable. Right. And folks inside will be able to hear you know, now since the building is closing in 15 minutes or? Yes, that would not be impacted. Okay. Okay. And, and the um, limitations on the number of people in the room based on what? Um, the need to evacuate or? Um, the capacity is determined by, um, you know, state law based on how many people per square foot are allowed in an enclosed area. Okay. And we would be um, utilizing that space, assuming it's installed and available while we're, we are still under the COVID guidelines? Uh, it would be used for uh, separating staff who are currently in areas that aren't really office-like. Okay. Um, <laughs> it would, so it would give them, and ideally the space we're considering that we're calling the teen area that moves um, the teen services staff to the teen room area. They'll have visibility of the teen room and be close to the teen room. Um, and it'll free up the office space that Susie is currently using for another staff member. Okay. Probably me. <laughs> Some of you may recall that was my old office. Yep. I've had two old offices now. <laughs> And will you take the sign down or put it up that we can see you? <laughs> I don't know. You know, I kind of like moving around. So I might, uh, I might just keep multiple offices. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, in particular, I think the, um, the cost effectiveness of creating that larger conference room on the main floor um, like I said, we can definitely use it now, but I also think it makes it, it makes a tremendous difference. I mean, when we have people who want to have meetings that are say seven to eight people, we really only have one space to offer them and that's our conference room. And, you know, sometimes we end up having group meetings like that book group meetings in the theater um, because that's our second space. And we'd also like to have a space that could accommodate a meeting like a board of trustees meeting um, so that, you know, the board can meet, but we're also not using our one and only conference room every time the board meets. A lot of times- If you were there on- 
the uh, people who have meetings will have refreshments. Would, is there any limitation or would this uh, um, uh, facility um, accommodate that? Is that uh, in, in putting in tables or garbage disposals? Or? Uh, we wouldn't be doing that, but our existing conference room doesn't have that either. Okay. People do sometimes bring in things like, you know, a box of coffee from Dunkin' Donuts. Yes. Um, or, you know, a spread of cookies, things like that. So it would basically be an identical sort of setup to the conference room that's on the second floor. Okay. And yeah. does, this, does this change the way, um, I guess it would fall under Jimmy Trapasso's uh, area. The, the, would it change the way he assigns the space to people that request it or we just follow the policy that's in place? We would just follow the existing policies and procedures. I mean, right now we have two small conference rooms. So let's say we added two more, they would just be, you know, you can have conference room A, B, C, or D. I can't say that it, it, you know, obviously it adds more work to book more people, but the procedures and the policies would be identical. And none of these spaces will be charged per use. That's not what they're designed for. And I mean, charging people money? Yeah, like the condo boards. They may see that space and say, oh. Well, that's, we that's. That. That's a conversation for the policy committee. <laughs> well, maybe we should add it if we're going to go ahead with this uh, setup. I would, yeah. <laughs> I'd have to be prepared is what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I think that, um, I think that the policy committee, is their intention is, I don't speak for you, Amanda, is to revisit that meeting room use policy as we get closer to perhaps being able to have meetings again. <laughs> And this actually would be helpful because currently if we're using the meeting room, you know, our main meeting room for say a board meeting or a staff training, and we have no other alternatives to offer people except to say, go to the cafe area. Um, if we can now say the second conference room is available, but because you're a for-profit entity, here's the fee. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like that. That's, that's yeah. very with the open cafe gallery area but an enclosed area i think you know i think there's a little bit more hope for possible um i wouldn't want to call it a revenue stream <laughs> but it could be but it could be and it could cover whatever uh labor costs we incur for cleanup and stuff like that yep Now, does, that, does that change the hours of operation in the sense that, no, I guess it doesn't because these meeting rooms won't be on any different levels than the current meeting rooms. Right. When I joined the board, we had a walkthrough of the whole library to visit a plan that had been drawn up for, I guess you could say, refurbishing the interior right? Not with so much with furniture as the way in which spaces were used. Are we putting that whole thing aside? And I know that, and I'm asking that now because we've had other conversations and Molly, you were part of them where you said, you know, maybe we don't need to do this. Maybe we can take care of this in incremental ways. This Here is the library. <laughs> yeah, this is one but, of those incremental ways. This is us using existing sort of, I guess in some ways, you know, existing nooks mm -hmm. and floor space that is actually underutilized. And some of it is the same space that they were identifying as adding rooms and areas. So in many ways, this is um, a complement to that plan but also I think a faster, much more cost-effective and in some ways flexible plan. So that leads to the next part of this question, which is I think as the board, we should understand maybe that we're going to move forward in these incremental ways. And that that being the case, 
how do we, I see that I love this idea of this small conference room behind the information desk. I think it is brilliant because it is something the public sees, but are we also going to maybe also in an incremental way in, put a new rug in that mezzanine area or that, you know, in that area, dress up, improve, you know, change the way that whole entrance way is. I almost see it as an entire project, but maybe I'm going too far there. No, I think, you know, I think in some ways you can see it as a continuum of things. I, you know, part of the other packages I'm putting together for you guys right now, it's just a matter of getting estimates, um, has to do with carpeting on that main level. And part of what happens when you put down carpeting is you, you know, they pick up and move the bookshelves and then you can tell them where you want them put back. <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, this ultimately could be pieces that come together for the entire first floor to look refurbished. Mm. Are we talking about moving the fireplace or the entrance? No, but we are definitely talking about um, improving the look and use of the the main floor as you come in in a way that makes a great impact for us but also has a great impact on the public and doesn't isn't money that we're throwing away because it would have to be undone if we do step in and do something like change where the circulation desk is located um, or something these pieces that we'd be adding are foundational pieces that wouldn't really need to be changed. Okay. Did that make sense? It's kind of hard to summarize it, but I'm, I'm looking at ways to give us the impact of that much larger plan without having to go to a whole, you know, let's close the library and do a giant remodel. Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense to me. I just feel like it's something that the board, we need to understand that, that long, I want to say longer term goal. And as a whole board, if we're going to present making these investments to the board. That's, yes. You know, because I don't know that everybody understands that. Maybe I'm wrong. I think it's a good idea to bring it up at the board meeting as part of the committee reporting out. That way we can have the conversation. Um, people can ask questions. The, you know, the group can understand what we're thinking about and can say, yes, that sounds great. Or, but what about this? You know, I think that that's a conversation that's good to have now. And it would be great to have it start to be sort of a regular feature for the next couple of board meetings that, you know, like for example, if I have three carpeting bids, I can give them to the, you know, the building committee, but the board as a whole is sort of already primed mm. to know that we're, you know, we need to replace carpet in certain areas. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would, you know, I'd love to get us um, started presenting to the board these steps and sort of a timeline. Mm -hmm. The exciting thing about it is once we get started, um, we get a lot of visual impact for our money and it happens pretty fast. <laughs> but you still have to find out about the ventilation. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's the first, that's basically. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, you know, some of these pieces are, the pieces themselves are in place. The question is, okay, if the existing vent or fire uh, sprinkler is right next to what would be the door, it's going to have to be relocated to the, you know, to the center of the room. So it's identifying what those things are, um, you know, and then getting a cost estimate for those pieces. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just hearing we're on the right track is Good news. <laughs> what, will the ex what will the exterior wall look like? Is it just a, a beige or is it a solid wall? Uh, no, there. it's like a glass wall with a metal type frame. Um, 
it looked very similar to our existing conference room type space, but instead of the framework being wood, it'll be metal. Um, and then there's some like frosted glass panels for semi-privacy. Um, you don't want people to be too private. Um, but we're basically looking at a, um, I mean, they would give us all the finishes to show us, but our idea is that it would sort of be gray and a matte silver so that it would pretty much match the carpeting that's around the building, which is a combination of blues and grays. I appreciate that. I was also asking along the lines of signage. If um, we're adding, I lost track, two or three spaces for meetings and we say mezzanine meeting room one, maybe there should be something affixed to that physical um, space that says, uh, you know, uh, Wednesday, uh, November 4th, uh, 1 p.m., Buildings and Grounds Committee. And then four o'clock, this group meets here. So anybody walking by knows that who belongs there and the people that are looking for it know that's where they go. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And there are certainly things um, out there that we can use um, to do that, that sort of thing. And, and we currently already have a sort of um, primitive system for things like that with our existing meeting rooms. We use a bulletin board and it says, you know, Fridays at 1230, you know, Westchester County Health Department meets here. But we can definitely come up with something that's more attractive, more permanent and flexible. Right. And if we if we make a permanent um, uh, identity for each space, we can encourage the groups that are meeting there to tell their members the name of the space. So in other words, instead of saying the meeting room on the third floor or the second floor, and they say, was well, the mezzanine the third floor? Is it the main floor? You know, just a standard identification because we're having multiple meeting rooms. Yeah. I think we could, you know, we might even be able to do things like call one the Hudson room and one the- That'd be great. That'd yeah. Be great. Well, you've answered all my questions. I think you did a lot of research. Thank you. It was, a. Uh, it's all very satisfying. I can see a lot of potential in our existing spaces. Molly, where will the bookcases go that are there now? Uh, well, we're working on that right now. Um, some of it is space that has been freed up on the second level so that we can, um, relocate sections of the collection. Some of it is um, we're using a lot of shelving that is in some cases not um, purpose built for the materials we're housing on it. So mm. the shelving is actually taking up a much larger footprint than it needs to for the amount of material that is available. Um, currently with adult services, you know, we're still sort of tentatively moving some things around. Um, but uh, we're determined to find new homes for everything. And you have the room for it. Yes, yes we do. And that implies you're, you're thinning the, uh, the book collection, right? Um, in some cases, but again, in some cases, it's not so much that the materials need to be cut back, is that they're not being housed efficiently on the shelving we have. Um, uh, that's very much true of our um, audio collection, the, um, the music collection in particular um, is not housed well. And some of the Spanish collection is, there's a lot of shelving we're not actually using efficiently. Um, so I, I actually think that the amount of material that will be cut back percentage wise is very small. Mm. Thanks, Molly. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm just thinking that when the board gets together for their meeting, would it be possible to, since we can't do a walkthrough tour anymore, just to have a camera describe this is what we're looking to do in this space and 
Sure. I think, yeah, if um, Molly, if you take pictures of the different spaces, then we can throw those up on the screen as, as we're presenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to do that. Thanks. Thank you. That's a good idea. Sounds interesting. Yeah, no promises it'll be as attractive as something they do on HGTV, but <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> get the whole thing. <laughs> Good. Is there oh. anything? Oh, go ahead. Oh, just one unrelated question, but how did everything go yesterday? And is the downstairs now back to normal? More or less, yeah. Everything went very well. Um, I would say at any one time there were more poll workers than there were actual voters. The turnout was very, very light. Um, it was steady, but light. Um, the setup was, was fine. They had a little bit of confusion in the morning, but our buildings and grounds um, staff, Joe and Pam, were amazing as usual. And everything went really smoothly. I think the downside is they love the space and they're probably going to be back next year. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that was nice is that whenever anybody said, because I was working down here, whenever um, somebody told the poll workers that they were voting for the first time, all of the poll workers cheered. And so oh. it, it was kind of a nice, happy thing that kept happening throughout the day. Oh, is that what they were cheering about? Yeah. <laughs> I could hear them up here. <laughs> That's nice. That is. Thank you. Any other things? No. No. Come okay. On. Thank you all very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Molly, John, Karen. You will. Yeah. Here, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. No problem.